Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that all of you and those that you care for, especially now, are doing well. And I very much thank you for joining us on this, our fifth in our series of discussions with leading change makers and urban analysts on questions emerging from the COVID-19 crisis. I'm Sarah Rosen Wartell, um, and I am the president of the Urban Institute. First, a quick couple of housekeeping notes for those of you who might not have access to a screen. Uh, this event is being recorded and the recording and all relevant links will be posted online afterwards. All of you as participants are muted, too big a crowd, but we encourage you to type your questions and comments into the question box at any time and we'll answer them at the end if we have time and if not, uh, they help us to set an agenda. And if you'd like to join the conversation with fellow watchers online, um, on Twitter, please use the hashtag live at urban. Here at urban, we are actually inspired in this moment to try to bring the power of evidence based knowledge to help change makers to make decisions to protect vulnerable families and communities and our economy. We've all seen that this crisis lays bare the inequities that are baked into the systems and structures of our society. And so we're thinking about this response in three dimensions. First, how do we ensure that the response to this crisis is equitable and reaches everyone? Third, how do we plan for the recovery of our society in a way that allows everyone to participate? And then finally, how do we reform our systems and make structural changes to create greater equity and resilience from what we know to be likely increased levels of shocks and stresses? We have a fierce determination that this crisis will not be allowed to further the inequities baked into our communities, and yet also a deep concern. This is a time that requires collaboration across sectors. Philanthropy plays a key role in responding to the national crisis, and both in the short term and in shaping the recovery. In the short term, we're already seeing philanthropy providing emergency relief funds popping up and helping target and support nonprofits and vulnerable communities to manage the immediate follow up. But funders must also serve an important role of working with grantees in developing agendas that address the deeper structural issues that COVID-19 has laid bare. This is a health crisis and so health philanthropy has a special leadership role to play. And health philanthropy knows better than anyone that health cannot be disentangled from the social and economic inequities longstanding and likely to be made worse by this crisis if we let them. And so for this conversation, we could have no better voices joining us than Dr. Julie Morita and Dr. Faith Mitchell. Julie is executive vice president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the nation's largest philanthropy dedicated solely to improving the nation's health. And it focuses work on that very knowledge that health vulnerability is closely tied to our economic, social, and community conditions. Before joining RWJF, Julie helped lead the Chicago Department of Public Health for nearly two decades, first as its medical director and then chief medical officer and then commissioner. As commissioner, she oversaw the public health needs of 2.7 million residents in our nation's third largest city. And I should say that RWJF is one of our great partners and with their partnership, we have recently been using, creating a, using our health reform monitoring survey to collect critical data on the effects of the COVID-19 crisis. And we'll provide links to that information um, on our website. We're also really excited to have Faith Mitchell with us here today and to have her here at the Urban Institute where she joined us last year. She's an Institute Fellow working with both the Center on Nonprofits on Philanthropy and the Health Policy Center. And she's helping to develop Urban's American Transformation Progress Project. Previously, Faith was President and CEO of Grantmakers in Health, a national organization that advises, informs, and supports health foundations and corporate giving programs. And she's held leadership positions at the National Academies, the US Department of State, uh, the Hewlett Foundation, and the San Francisco Foundation. Uh, so if uh, others might uh, join me, um, I would uh, love to thank you. Ah, and there they are. Uh, great. So nice to see you, uh, Faith and Julie. Um, so I'm going to start with you, uh, Julie. We've known for a long time that health outcomes are directly tied to race and income in this country. 
and we've worked together on those issues. And we're already seeing devastating health impacts on Black Americans. And job loss and food insecurity is particularly affecting Latinx and Black communities. And as economic crises worsen in the industries that especially employ these uh, workers, we're likely to see added severity. Julie, can you talk a little bit about RWGF's efforts to promote equity during the recovery and your advice for other health philanthropists who want to keep equity at the forefront? Thanks so much for hosting this and inviting me to join you, Faith. We really appreciate Urban Institute's partnership with us throughout the years. Um, the question that you ask is really an important question. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's vision for a culture of health requires that we really address barriers to health and well-being. We're looking to create an, a, place, a place or a world where everyone has a fair and just opportunity for health and well-being. And the barriers to health and well-being are things like poverty and discrimination and their consequences, like lack of access to um, good jobs with fair wages, stable housing, access to good food and healthy food and access to healthcare services. And so when we look at what's happening or has happened with the pandemic, you can see that these baseline areas that we've been focusing on for so long really need to be addressed, that the work that the foundation has been doing is really the right work to be doing. So my staff, in addition to that, our grantees have really just been doubling down on our focus on addressing the social determinants of health and equity, really focusing in on some of the policies that we really need to address. So with partners like you, we've been focusing on making sure that there's increasing economic and housing stability, looking at ways that we can increase access to food security, and also looking at ways to increase healthcare access. And so those are the kinds of things that we're really focusing on, recognizing that these kinds of things need to be done and just in support of folks who are most adversely affected by this pandemic. So Julie, I just wanna push, um, um, ask for a little more detail on that. You're a national foundation, and so you work with a lot of national organizations who are working on developing policy agendas, um, and building kind of innovative strategies and uh, sharing um, different models. But I noticed looking at the extraordinary RSVP list that we had, how many local and community-based health organizations are on this call. So can you talk a little bit about particularly some grant-making strategies that you're thinking about and your thoughts about how local philanthropy can complement that to take this equity approach that you just described? Yeah, I think um, so a lot of the work that we do is in partnership with other organizations to promote to build research or to support things like fair um, uh, paid or paid and families paid family and sick leave those kinds of policies at a federal level and also at a state and local level. But there's other things that can be done at a local level that really I think are important at this time local philanthropy can really work with helping public health engage community. I think what we recognize a key element of addressing equity is making sure that those who are being adversely impacted by the disease and actually by some of the interventions that we're trying to implement to protect people. If you're not able to take advantage of these protections, you're really, these, these interventions aren't going to work for you. And so if local philanthropy can help bridge the gap between governmental public health, community organizations and the community, that's a huge, huge effort that's really important. Having been in Chicago, we tapped into philanthropy to help us to bridge those gaps between government agencies and the community. And I think local philanthropy can play a major role in that area. Um, so Faith, you led a coalition of both national and local health philanthropies for many years and have a lot of um, experience in seeing where philanthropy can make a real difference. Um, can you talk also about your ideas for what they can do and in particular, um, in the midst of sort of a flurry of policy making and initiatives and actions, how do we keep equity centered in this conversation? Well, um, thank you, Ju thank you, uh, Sarah. Um, when I think about this, the, the challenges and the opportunities that the pandemic uh, offers to philanthropy, I've been thinking about it in terms of, kind of the short term and the long term and equity considerations can be part of uh, both elements and you know it's not either or it's like the short-term response is going to then feed into the long term so in the short term what you see is um, not just organized foundations but also you know individual philanthropy and corporate philanthropy and other forms of philanthropy 
that have been addressing food needs and economic support needs in vulnerable communities. And we know that that's not going to go away anytime soon. And so with an equity lens, it's like philanthropy needs to stay focused on the needs of vulnerable communities in the long term. And hopefully many foundations and, and other funders already were and were aware of the challenges in those communities. Um, I think also um, when looking farther out, um, there's clearly going to be a lot of community rebuilding that has to be done across the country uh, in all kinds of communities, but it's going to be especially sharply focused in these same vulnerable communities. And so, you know, funders can be thinking now and kind of planning ahead for how, uh, again, whether it's uh, the kind of uh, economic and employment impacts that are not going to go away overnight in vulnerable communities, the access to services that, that Julie referenced that were already a problem. And it's, you know, we can see even more clearly now how lack of access affects people's health. So that's another kind of long-term equity issue. Um, and civic engagement even. It's interesting that of course the response to the pandemic um, highlighted the work of health philanthropy, but foundations of all kinds, funders of all kind have gotten involved. And it's been interesting to me to see how some funders are beginning to focus on the civic engagement piece as another way of building communities and building resilience in the long run. Um, and um, I'm sure that behavioral health and mental health uh, issues will become more and more evident and will also be part of the, not only the immediate response, but for sure the kind of resilience and rebuilding down the road. So I want to come back to that point in particular about how do we use information and power to give voice to community voices in setting the remedies and in designing the strategies for communities. We have actually a number of questions about that. But before I do that, um, and uh, Julie, maybe there are in related questions. Um, you sat in the seat of a health commissioner as a commissioner for a city. So you can now imagine, and in, I gather are still engaged with your former colleagues, um, about the job of the health commissioner in so many of our communities around the country. Um, and that sense of um, uh, sort of enormous weight and urgency that they're feeling every day. Um, so talk a little bit about what you think their needs are so that philanthropists can imagine the ways in which you, you described collaboration, but maybe make that a little more granular about how the public sector and um, philanthropy and nonprofits can work in a crisis like this. Yeah, so I, I, I don't have to imagine what it's like. Um, several of us at the foundation actually have been had leadership positions in governmental public health in our past lives. And so Rich, as former acting director at CDC and me as health commissioner in Chicago, there's several other former health commissioners that are working at the foundation. And many of us have been tapped in to provide consultation or guidance to different jurisdictions. So I live in Chicago right now and have actually been consulting with and working with the state of Illinois as they're developing their strategic plans um, for response, but also for recovery. And I know that they're working really, really hard and they're working very quickly to try, try to get the systems in place. And these systems aren't necessarily as strong as they could have been. I think public health infrastructure is often neglected. I think we talk about it, public health at our dinner tables now in the midst of a crisis, like my kids talk about N95s and r naughts and disease curves, that doesn't happen in times when it's calm and there's peace. But we talk about these things now, but the, and the funding surges at that time, but then it goes away. And so there's some, the, right now public health is trying to develop the systems that would be great to have had in place in the past that do not exist. So I think what's really helpful from a philanthropy perspective is for local foundations and national foundations to engage with governmental public health and find out what are they needing. Because though federal resources are flowing, they don't fill every gap. And there are gaps that are left uncovered and philanthropy has the flexibility to help fill some of those gaps. And so what I think about it is in terms of who's not covered, we, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation early on, we made a $50 million investment in humanitarian aid for food, housing, um, economic supports for those people who weren't being reached by the federal supports and and also to lift up the fact that these things that are not necessarily closely linked to health traditionally are so desperately linked to health 
And to make that point, we made these kinds of investments. And I think if others think about that, engaging with public health, finding out what the, what the needs are, and then trying to fill those gaps, it would be really helpful at this time. Um, so Faith, philanthropy often works with local officials like uh, Julie's former colleagues in city and county health departments, but also at the state level. Um, and uh, I know that particularly some now, uh, local foundations have a harder time thinking about policy and policy advocacy. Um, and I'm just, can you talk a little bit about the approaches that um, local health philanthropies can take at this time that can help move an agenda and advance policy consistent with what their degree of comfort is on these issues? Yes, um, so it's a national pandemic, but of course it plays out in communities and especially in health philanthropy, which I know best, local funders have just a, a, I think, a wealth of experience and skills that they can bring to bear on the responses to the pandemic. For one thing, um, as Julie kind of referenced, local funders know the local community. They know the local players. They are hopefully, you know, trusted resources themselves in their communities, and they have an ability to lift up community voices and make the connections between what's going on at the community level and what's going on in the state house, whether it's through like data collection or, um, you know, kind of literally talking to people through whatever mechanisms are available these days and communicating that information to policymakers. And, um, and of course, many are more and more involved in policy and advocacy and kind of keeping an eye on how policies are playing out at the local level. So just to give an example, um, I was just reading about actually in Connecticut where the Connecticut Health Foundation was saying, we can't just have drive in, drive through testing because a lot of people don't have cars. You know, so it's like a local level policy where they were saying we need to also have testing at community health centers because those health centers are already located in vulnerable communities. They have staff members that people know and so forth. Um, and so they can bring that lens that a, you know, a, a sort of a, 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 like a federal funder or a federal, even a, like a national funder um, would not necessarily have and, and use that lens then not only to support equity as we were discussing earlier, but also to change policies kind of locally. Um, Julie, one of the things we've all learned is that when lived experience is at the table, policy decisions get made differently. Um, and we had just gotten better, I think, recently in uh, lifting up community voices. And yet now that we're all um, back in our second bedrooms trying to do our jobs, I worry a lot about the ability to keep the voices of the folks who are experiencing these crises at the table. And I also know that a lot of nonprofits um, who are themselves suddenly under terrible financial strain um, it don't, don't always have the time and the resources to be part of collective tables where they can bring that community voice together. So again, thinking about the role of philanthropy here, are there ways it can try to bridge that gap, both of which are so important to getting to equitable outcomes? Yeah, I mean, I think the technology challenge makes it very difficult. Uh, but I think it's really, really important. It's, never, it's more important now than ever before for us really to have these voices at the table. And so I think what we've often done when I was in local government and also now in our position is not necessarily assume that we know who the right people are to have at the table, but to really count on trusted entities within community. So one of the things that we did with our humanitarian aid was really we gave a, a portion of our $50 million to local and regional philanthropy so they could get it into the hands of the organizations who actually need Need it the most with the focus on lifting up voices so that we could actually get these community voices these community people connected and engaged as well and to meet some of their needs so i think it's really a matter of recognizing what our limitation is at a federal at a national level that we really need to partner with those who are closer to the ground to get the resources to where they need to be but highlighting what we want to be done with, this, with these resources as well so we're getting really fabulous questions. I apologize, I'm looking away, but I'm reading the questions that are coming in through the chat. Um, and Faith, I wanna turn one of them to you. Um, uh, foundations often um, have their own imperatives, their own boards, their own governing processes. 
Um, but in many ways, none of them have the resources to deal with crises of this kind. And they are often most effective when they pool their resources together around a shared strategy. Um, what do you think are the prospects for that in a moment like this when we're both dealing with the challenges of coordination and at the same time of urgency? I think the prospects are actually good. And, you know, uh, having funders work together is something we preached all the time when I was at Grant Makers in Health. And it's challenging because boards have different agendas, as you say, and people serve different geographic areas and so forth. But we already have examples um, on like a regional basis, for sure, that a lot of the rapid relief funds in different parts of the country involve multiple funders. Sometimes it's, you know, Pub, all, of all kinds, you know, corporate and private and organized philanthropy and so forth. So not only are funders working across areas, you know, so health funders are also in this moment kind of tackling economic issues and housing, as you referenced, but also funders are, are coming together and, and, you know, working collectively in a really um, kind of inspiring way that hopefully will survive this moment, you know, Julie said something about, you know, the money surges and then it goes away. Um, and so let's hope that this isn't just another surge, you know, that then we go back to the status quo, like this time next year, uh, or something like that. Um, I also wanted to piggyback, Sarah, on the question that you asked, uh, Julie, about lifting up voices, because it's something I think about a lot. And um, uh, a point that has been coming up that I think is important is that uh, in kind of in the moment, many of the relief funds are going to service providing organizations, but that it's also really important to fund the uh, smaller organizations that serve minor, uh, uh, communities of color that may not be direct service providers themselves, but which in the long run are going to have a really important role to play in elevating the voices that we care about in helping sustain communities and helping to identify problems that we might not even realize are out there that are just kind of germinating, but that are going to have a sustained effect, yep. um, you know, on how communities survive this period. Um, Julie, I want to try to weave two different um, sort of theories of change that foundations can advance um, together and ask you how you see each of these playing a role at this moment. Um, the first is about narrative change. Um, this is, on the one hand, uh, a unique moment to look at um, health consequences and a unique moment when, to some extent, we understand that everyone is essential and perhaps, or at least are reminded that and reminded the way in which our futures are integrated. So how are you thinking about narrative change in this time? And then similarly, um, uh, also about disaggregating the data. And um, one of my colleagues points out that thanks to flatten the curve, probably more Americans understand predictive analytics and modeling than have in a very long time. And we're hoping at Urban we can seize on that audience. Um, but um, particularly right now where we have uh, these crises um, affecting and the, the remedies, um, not always reaching all of the populations we care most about, um, how are you thinking about making sure that we know where the need is and how successfully we're reaching that need in real time. That's great. I, I think uh, evidence has to inform our policies and the changes that we're trying to make. And so disaggregation of data is essential. What's so disheartening, and it really is emblematic of the, the crumbling infrastructure in public health, is that the public health data have not been available consistently about who's being affected most by COVID, both in terms of disease, but also the economic impacts. And I think that's just a reflection of our disinvestment in disaggregation of data. So that is a top priority for, for us in terms of promotion and support of that kind of work. And so we've been working with a variety of groups to actually lift this up as a concept and we'll be looking at ways that we can actually support additional disaggregation of data. But it's, it's fundamental to the work that we need to do. There's no way that we can advocate for um, effective policy unless we have the data to really inform what it is that we're doing and we're promoting. And I can't remember your first question. Oh, it was about narrative change. Oh, narrative change. So the foundation is really committed. Part of our theory of change is really relates to narrative change, but not just that, but also mindset shifting. Because it's not enough just to change the narrative. We actually have to change the way that people are thinking. A key and fundamental mindset that we are focusing on is really that 
health is about more than just health care. And that's where the social determinants of health really rise up. And that this pandemic has underscored the relationship between these social factors and health outcome. You look at who's being disproportionately impacted by this disease and also by the interventions that we're putting out there. And you can see that um, there's this inequity that exists in the social, meeting the social needs and economic needs of our, our public and, and, and people within our communities. And unless we address those social and economic needs, we aren't going to be able to address health overall. Um, so Faith, one of the areas that um, a, a pandemic like this really puts to the fore is mental health. Um, we probably had uh, 20 plus percent of the American population who dealt with different mental health challenges, maybe more um, undiagnosed. Um, and uh, there is a kind of shared experience of anxiety and isolation and other things that the uh, way we've responded to the pandemic is certainly going to exacerbate. Um, how do health philanthropy think about the challenges of mental health? I think it is uh, the case that some across the country in some communities are very focused on it and others less so. Mm -hmm. How do you see change emerging from this and what should local communities be thinking about in this case? I would, I would I'm think, I've been thinking about a couple of things in that regard. So what funders can do is maybe first off, really recognize the importance of mental health because as you point out, some have been involved in supporting those services for quite a while. Many haven't, but um, we already have a sense of the mental health challenges of the pandemic. And as I said before, I think once the kind of dust has settled a little bit more and we're able to get out of our houses and interact more, I think we're going to see that the problems, uh, people have really suffered even more than we currently realize. And so there's a need, <clears throat> excuse me, for uh, services, you know, in local communities. There's going to be a need clearly for people, you know, just supporting people. And maybe you um, use some models that are out there already, like community health workers who have done kind of door-to-door -door health care and find ways to enlist them now more broadly in behavioral health. There are digital technologies um, that can be helpful there. So I think it's, but I, I think the danger is if we um, don't recognize the, the magnitude of the need. I was, I've been thinking a lot about my dad these days who was six when the Great Depression started and he died a couple of years ago at 95 and the depression shadowed his, his entire life and how he looked at the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hopefully the pandemic won't plunge us into a sustained economic depression, the way that depression did in the 20s, but still you know that there's going to be a lasting damage to individuals and families and communities. And we just, I think we're just kind of at the tip of the iceberg now. And again, going back to vulnerable communities, uh, certain communities are going to be super impacted. And so funders need to, to bring that awareness and to be thinking about how they can respond in a variety of ways because we can't just depend on face-to-face -face interaction these days. We're gonna to have to be thinking about multiple ways of addressing the issue. Well, um, you started in your answer, it didn't entirely end there, but you started in your answer with a glimmer of hope. Uh, and so I'm gonna ask Julie, uh, things that you see that might be promising results from learning from this experience. So Julie, I'm gonna to ask to end it, if you would, with what gives you hope in this moment? What do you think we can do better coming out of this perhaps that um, maybe we couldn't before? Faith mentioned technology's role, um, an awareness of mental health maybe being two things that might come positive out of this. Do you have others to add? Well, I think I have to, I mean, I think the point that I was making about how people are recognizing the uh, interconnectedness between social and economic well-being and, and health overall, that has been lifted up like it has never been before. And I think that's really, really important so that we can make the right kind of investments that allow us to be better prepared in for future pandemics, better prepared at baseline and then also better prepared in, for future pandemics. The other thing that gives me hope is that this conversation about equity is talked about is, is higher and higher has higher profile than it ever has, has ever been before. I really feel like people are confronting the need to address the needs of everyone and recognizing that when 
um, everyone's needs are met, that we are all healthier and better off for it. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that as a result of the pandemic, we'll be able better to, the solutions that we develop moving forward will actually address some of these structural and systemic changes that have been dis, disinvested in previously, improve those moving forward so that we are doing better overall from a health perspective in peacetime as well as for the next pandemic. Well, I hope both of you are right about those hopeful signs and that we as a community do our very best uh, in this moment to try to work on simultaneously effective response recovery and ultimately a long term structural changes that will make us less vulnerable to these effects in the future. Let me end with a uh, encouraging particularly people in local communities who may want um, some sources of disaggregated data. You might take a look at a feature we have called where low income jobs are being lost by COVID-19. Um, it's a it's it's because the reporting is not always um, as granular as we would like, uh, these are predictive tools that look at the sectors where we are seeing real job related loss and then um, allows you to look at each census track to see where those jobs are. And so uh, communities that are trying to target neighborhoods could find a lot of insight about their local uh, communities and where jobs are going to be lost ahead of finding the actual statistics. That's the spirit at which we're trying to help uh, power the solutions to this crisis through knowledge. Um, I, I want to end by saying uh, first to Faith how grateful we are to have you with us at Urban and thank you for thank spurring you. this idea. And Julie, great partner and terrific conversation. Thanks for being here and thanks to all thank of you. you. We'll see you again soon for another in this series. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.